we are speaking metaphorically here about aspects of human functioning that we've only really begun to understand and that there is a dimension that I conceptualize where on the one end of the spectrum we have personalities that are more neurotic or characterized by the features that typically generate some neurosis and those folks on the other end of the spectrum who are more disturbed in character. And I want to compare and contrast these two groups and I want to demonstrate as clearly as I can how different these folks are from one another so that you clearly understand why approaching dealing with them, whether you're in a relationship with them and you're trying to understand and just deal with them on an interpersonal level, or you're trying to intervene with them therapeutically as a therapist, why it is so important to understand the difference so that you don't come at the problem with the same framework. Because if you do, if you have the same framework for both groups of people, you will put yourself at a, an extreme disadvantage and you will only enable the problem to continue. So let's take one dimension of functioning, and that is the presence and extent of anxiety. Anxiety is that kind of primal emotion that we fear. It's kind of akin to fear. It's not the same as fear. It kind of feels like fear. When we have an identifiable fear, something that causes us to be unnerved and we can pinpoint its source, we call it a phobia. You know, like I'm afraid of snakes, okay? That's a phobia. Or I'm afraid of speaking in public, okay? When I get up to, st to speak in public, you know, my heart starts to race, I perspire, I start to get, you know, all trembly, my voice starts to qu quiver, okay? That's a phobia because we can pinpoint its source. When we feel like that, but we can't identify why we feel that way, or the reason that we feel that way has to do with some unconscious fear, we call it anxiety. Now, if you're a, if you're a halfway decent and sensitive therapist, you can smell anxiety around the block. Just being in the same room with an anxious person will make most anybody feel anxious too. You can sense anxiety. It's unnerving. When, when a person is anxious, you can't help but feel anxious for them. When you see them with those beads of sweat and, and the trembling, and you shake their hand and it's as cold as ice and clammy, you know, you feel badly for them. Anxiety is a big player in neurosis. A big player. It's a big player in the symptoms that neurotics have. And it's a big player in the difficulties that they experience. They are neurotic primarily because they are anxious. And most of the time, they don't even know what the anxiety is all about. That's what therapy is there to help them figure out. Now, on the other hand, the other end of the spectrum, the character disturbed person doesn't have enough of what some folks call adaptive fearfulness, doesn't have enough anxiety, doesn't experience enough anxiety. As a matter of fact, in some cases, where we wish it would be there, it's not there at all. You know, perhaps if the person got just apprehensive enough about that crime they were going to commit, or about that horrible thing that they were just about to say to their mate, 
or about that dastardly underhanded thing that they were just about to do to their coworker. Perhaps if they got just a little shaken, they wouldn't do it. Neurotics, anxious wrecks. Disturbed characters, not anxious enough. It is amazing to me, to this day still, how many good neurotic clinicians will find anxiety where it doesn't exist. We will frame almost anything like an issue of fear. And as I mentioned in my book, the classic example is when you have someone who is by nature thrill-seeking, danger-seeking, who likes and craves variety, and who abhors the idea of commitment, and so therefore dallies around in relationships fairly ravenously, conquest after conquest, soaking up as much excitement and titillation as they can get their hands on, and then somebody frames it as a fear of intimacy. I mean, that perspective, the perspective that there must be an underlying anxiety or a fear driving that is so limiting. It is so limiting and so biasing. There are a dozen other possibilities driving that kind of behavior, not just anxiety. And in many cases, what distinguishes the disturbed character from the neurotic is the fact that anxiety is not the player. It's not the reason that they're doing what they're doing that's a problem. And to assume so is a problem not only for the therapist trying to intervene, but it's a huge problem for the person in a relationship with this person. I, I, I know so many people in problematic relationships who just simply assumed whenever, whenever a behavior was exhibited, that really unnerved them about their partner, their assumption always was, well, I wonder what's really troubling them underneath. I, I wonder what leads them to be so fearful of commitment. I wonder what leads them to be so insecure underneath. All these assumptions automatically made because we bombarded them with these messages. And we haven't realized in the process that we are setting them up to so misperceive their situations that they stay in them. That they stay hooked up with unsavory characters because they assume these traditional notions about why they're behaving the way they are. So one of the main things to understand about the disturbed character versus the neurotic is unlike the hyper-conscientious person, the non-conscientious person is not anxious enough. 